uh, I see that the next speaker just left uh, uh, the meeting. Uh, so I will just uh, continue uh, so, the next. Yes. yes, I'm going to call upon our next keynote speaker, Dr. Andreas M. Luca from Germany to deliver his keynote speech, please. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, yeah. kind introduction. So first of all, we need to um, I need to share my screen. Yes. So and now because my screen my screen is very busy. So <laughs> let's see what we can do. There it is. And so like this. So no, not like this. So we are asked a question by Sudipta Nasker. What are the adverse effects of oxytocin therapy? So it's still under progress as mentioned by Dr. Menal Atwan. So they haven't found any side effects still not as the research is under progress. I hope I have settled your question. Thank you. So now you should be able to see my screen. Do you see my? Oh, just, uh, yes, please. That's OK, very well. So let's see if the pointer works. Yes, very well. OK, so uh, good morning again, everyone. Um, my name is Andreas Dubke. I'm head of orthopedic pathology and vice head of static pathology at the University Medical Center Hamburg Eppendorf in Hamburg, Germany. Um, my speech is called An Exotic Souvenir, uh, which is a case uh, report on dawn pathology. So, however, um, this is a mixed audience. So, uh, uh, some of you, I hope a lot of you, are pathologists which is pretty cool. Um, some of you might be residents uh, in pathology, which is also pretty cool. And some of you are students, and some of you might be non-pathologists. So um, what I'm trying to do, I try to pick you up and keep you uh, and bring you to the same level so that you are able to, um, uh, to follow uh, the story of this case report. And, um, Another thing is that there are two basic um, basic approaches to uh, to uh, to, per, to transfer some information. Um, one is a very practical view, so that you can follow this case report like a hands-on story. Uh, the other way would be a very comprehensive, very detailed review to prove to you that I'm capable of my topic and I uh, clear every detail but then you won't take anything away from this. So therefore, I will try to share my knowledge with you and I want uh, you to uh, take this knowledge. And therefore, I uh, will keep it in a very practical way. So um, I will begin uh, with the basic uh, principles of bone pathology that you uh, get some, just some basic facts. So, um, the basic principles of bone pathology are those two. First, uh, specific lesions of bone appear in a reproducible clinical context. And the next important thing is that a close correlation between clinical features, radiology, and histology lead to a reliable diagnosis. If you just take this away from this talk, you'll learn a lot. So um, how do bone tumors become apparent? Uh, this is also very basic, uh, but it's a very general knowledge, general knowledge. So um, pain is a very important symptom, especially in malignant bone tumors, pathologic fracture, and not very infrequent, uh, bone tumors are an incidental finding. 
some classic cases that an individual falls down, has pain in the extremities or somewhere, uh, and conventional x-ray is made. And before that, the patient did not have a uh, bone tumor. But after that, there is a bone tumor, although nobody looked for it. So um, pain, pathologic fracture, and incidental finding. Of course, uh, when the tumor grows or is at a very prominent position, you can see a swelling or a palpable tumor. Um, so, but this is to the cases that uh, grew very large and are a very prominent position. So, um, if we talk about bone pathology, uh, um, it's very important to have some basic knowledge in bone tumors because we know um, we've got simple fractures or uh, osteomyelitis. And then uh, another important issue, uh, which uh, especially bone pathologists uh, have a lot to deal with, are bone tumors. So what um, are the most frequent benign bone tumors? This is a short list. You can make this uh, list even longer, but uh, you have to know uh, these four tumors. So first of all, the osteochondroma. This is just a cartilage cap with a stalk of bone, uh, which is continuously fused to the underlying bone. And the osteochondromas uh, we find in the first two decades of life. After the skeletal uh, uh, maturation is finished, uh, the osteochondroma stops to grow. The osteoosteoma is another important benign bone tumor uh, in the thirds. And um, interestingly, it's sensitive to NSARs. So, um, and it causes a prominent sclerotic re reaction in the surrounding tissue. The giant cell tumor of bone is an important bone in the uh, younger adults and middle-aged adults, with, with, which is a destructive lesion um, uh, basically in the metaphysis of the bones for the potential in a very, very rare uh, event uh, to metastasize, but those metastases, especially to the lungs, behave clinically indolent. And of course, you might know the enchondromas, which are frequent incidental finding, but have a very low risk uh, to uh, progress into chondrosarcoma. Um, now uh, we go to the malignant tumors, and especially in children, uh, you have to know uh, the most, uh, well, the two most frequent malignant bone tumors. Namely, this is osteosarcoma and this is Ewing sarcoma. Well, osteosarcoma is defined as a malignant mesenchymal tumor producing bone matrix. And Ewing sarcoma is a small blue brown cell tumor that behaves very aggressive and has a specific EWSR1 translocation. And now uh, the group of the small blue brown cell sarcoma is continuously growing, as we see uh, uh, tumors uh, from the same family with other uh, translocations like the SIGDAX and the B-core. Uh, round cell sarcomas, and also some Ewing sarcomas where uh, it's not possible to detect a specific translocation. So if we go to uh, the adult people, it's a completely different story because the spectrum of bone tumors is completely different. Uh, the most frequent malignant tumors in the bone in adults are metastasis. So namely tumors from the lung, thyroid, breast, kidney, and from the prostate, followed by multiple myeloma. And on third place comes the chondrosarcoma, uh, the most frequent primary uh, malignant bone tumor in adults. So, um, so this is um, a basic diagnostic algorithm for bone tumors. Uh, which uh, you have to go through regardless whether you are a radiologist or a pathologist or oncologist or an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that the diagnostic of bone tumors is always an interdisciplinary approach. Of course, it's possible 
if you are very skilled in your own discipline, like pathology or radiology. Um, you have a very uh, high probability to uh, make a correct and definite diagnosis. Uh, but it's very difficult and it's even more dangerous uh, to do um, uh, a diagnosis only uh, with your own diagnostic discipline. The final diagnosis should also always include an interdisciplinary approach. And the best thing uh, to perform this is, for example, in a tumor board or in an expert panel. So, and if you do this, uh, you have to follow some basic uh, steps. And um, well, this is the uh, well, quite, I hope, well known basic diagnostic algorithm for bone tumors. First of all, we need to know the age of the patient and the gender. Then we know the uh, have to know the location of the bone tum tumor, which bone is affected, and where in the bone. Are there uh, multiple lesions, or is this a solitary lesion? What kind of pattern has this particular lesion? Well, this is the most complex, um, the most difficult, uh, but quite a specific uh, point because uh, most of the bone tumors always behave in a similar way, of course, with a little variety. Uh, but um, the radiographs and the histology of some regions can be very, very specific. So, and uh, those are basically uh, features that can also be uh, entered by radiology. And here you see the point number five. This is the uh, reaction of the periosteum. This gives us a lot of information about how aggressive the lesion is. For example, if we get a very long growing lesion like an osteoastoma, uh, there's a good chance that we've got a very prominent sclerotic rim next to the nidus of the osteoastoma. And if we've got a very aggressive tumor uh, like an osteosarcoma or a Ewing sarcoma, there's a possibility that we can see the Cotman triangle, which I will explain later on. So the simplest uh, thing is uh, the point number six, the intralesional matrix. And so we've got osteoid calcifications or even no matrix. So I will go uh, through uh, this list and give you some examples. So first, age um, is very important because as I said, the spectrum of tumors um, is, is variable with age. So and if you draw a line, I think about age 30, you can separate uh, two major groups. Um, the group of the, of the tumors of the young adults and children. And there you have to know, as I said before, malignant bone tumors at the young age is the urine sarcoma sarcoma and the osteosarcoma. And then there are a lot of benign tumors, but the variety is quite high, like simple bone cysts or chondroblastoma, the non osophagic fibroma, osteochondroma, fibrous dysplasia, uh, the osteosteoma, which is a very painful lesion, the aneurysmal bone cysts, with an, which is an expansile lesion, or the lung and cystocytosis that makes sharp demarcated osteolysis. Uh, so when we go uh, to the older individuals, first uh, there's a giant cell tumor of bone, which is a very destructive lesion. And when we go to the older individuals, we see uh, metastasis, 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 followed by multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma, and then we encounter the chondrosarcoma and the periosteal osteosarcoma, and of course, uh, the codoma. Uh, the benign tumors are in the older individuals uh, a little bit more rare. So we find osteoma and enchondroma. And if you just stick to this simple algorithm of age, you've got a good baseline. Of course, the variety 
of bone tumors is much more higher. Uh, but those are just the most, most frequent um, known bone tumors. So um, this is just a radiograph example. For example, we got a woman. She is uh, 72 years old. And um, this is a AP conventional radiograph. And if you do not know anything about radiology, um, you can help yourself with one simple trick. You just take a look at the image and if it's a symmetrical image, you just go through the image and uh, um, make a, a, for example, uh, a midline. And then you compare the structures on the right and the structures on the left, right, left, acetabulum, acetabulum, femoral head, femoral head, trochanter, trochanter, metaphysis, metaphysis, diaphysis, diaphysis. And then you easily see whether there's something going on or something wrong. And another thing is that you can go uh, uh, along the surface of the bone, then you see if there's a continuity. And here it's easy to spot, but there's a crack. This is a easy to spot fracture. And on the other side, you see that the surface of the bone is a continuous line. So this is a very simple approach. And of course, this is a very easy image because you see the fracture, uh, but it's not always that easy. So here we got a fracture in a woman that is 72 years old. This hurts. So we've got pain. We've got a pathologic fracture. It's an old woman. And we can see that uh, there are some lytic areas. So in summary, this is suspicious of malignancy. And if it's a uh, lesion that is, is uh, suspicious for malignancy, of course, um, the, the most likely diagnosis is a metastasis. So again, kidney, lung, thyroid, and breast. And in this case, it's just a metastasis of a non breast cancer uh, with a uh, pathological fracture of the female head. So, the next example is a uh, 64 years old man. And you see at this um, CT image again that if you compare the both sides, we see that here is an osteolytic lesion in the metaphysial region of the femur. Um, there seems to be some matrix, but it's basically a destructive lesion that also is protrude, protruding um, uh, in the extra osseous soft tissues and in the marrow space. Um, so again, here's pain, it's an older individual, and this is the metastasis of a urethelial carcinoma. image after the osteosynthesis of uh, the lesion, just to show you a conventional radiograph, it's quite easy to see the osteolytic areas in this case. So age is a very important factor. Then the location. Uh, here you can see um, image drawing of a human skeleton, uh, which shows you some uh, bone tumors. Uh, of course, this list is not complete because there are many, many, many more bone tumors. Um, however, um, this is just to give you an example of what you can expect if you encounter a lesion in a specific bone. For example, in the skull, you can expect uh, lana and cell histocytosis. At the skull base, you can expect codoma. In the jaws, uh, you can expect odontogenic tumors. And even if you go down in all metaphysis of long bones or the central axial skeleton parts, like the pelvis, you can expect malignant bone tumors. They are very frequent at the metaphysis of the lung bones and the pelvis. In the sacrum, in the lower uh, regions of the spine, you can find codoma. And a tumor that is almost always in the same location is, for example, the adamantinoma, which is almost 
I say almost because there are um, some manifestations in other regions. Uh, but uh, this is the adamant genoma, which is always in the interior parts of the tibia. Uh, and uh, is to be noticed as a osteolytic lesion with a sclerotic uh, periphery. Um, in the lower extremity, you find non ossifying fibromas. And more than half of all enchondromas you'll find in the tubular bones of the hands. Osteoblastoma is frequently located in the region of the spine. And again, metastasis and multiple myeloma can be found anywhere in the skeleton. So location is important. And the second um, point of location is the location in the bone. So we've got tumors that are all, almost exclusively appear in the epiphysis, like the chondroblastoma. In the metaphysis, you find osteosarcoma, aneurysmal bone cyst, and the giant cell tumor. In the diaphysis, you can expect periosteal osteosarcoma and the adamantinoma. And uh, the periosteal uh, location is classic for periosteal osteosarcoma. The tumor that is often located eccentric is a non ossifying fibroma. And again, metastasis and multiple myeloma can be found anywhere. Next thing is um, solitary or multiple lesions. Of course, if it's a solitary lesion, it could be anything. But if you get multiple lesions, this is also a very important piece of information. If it's multiple, again, it can be metastasis, it can be multiple myeloma, but there are other, other lesions that also can be multi, multifocal, like the epithelioid hemangioma of bone, the non ossifying fibroma, and of course, enchondromas, especially when you've got enchondromatosis, namely uh, Olliase disease. Or if you've got hereditary uh, multiple osteochondromas, uh, the osteochondromas can be multifocal and they have an elevated um, uh, probability to, um, to turn into malignant bone tumors. And of course, if you've got a general disorder like a hyperparathyroidism, uh, there can be multiple brown tumors. So it matters whether it's a solitary lesions or if there are multiple lesions. So the pattern of lesional changes is very complex because every bone tumor has its own characteristics. Uh, I give you one, one characteristic example. So uh, those are the conventional x-rays of a skeletal immature patient. So here you see the growth plates still open. And um, in the dorsal air, uh, regions of the um, tibia, there's a lesion. It is osteolytic. It has got a sclerotic rim. And this was an incidental finding with no pain. So um, no pain, skeletal uh, uh, immature, and osteolytic lesion, uh, sclerotic rim and an eccentric location in the lower extremity. This is quite characteristic for a non ossifying fibroma. Um, if you watch those lesions, you will see that they will become sclerotic uh, during the time. And basically those are lesions that can be spotted and identified on radiology. Uh, it's a, uh, basically a lesion that can be just surveyed and uh, do not need to have a biopsy done. Um, the point number five is the um, reaction of the periost. And um, this is um, of, a, of great importance, especially when we have a malignant bone tumor. Um, this is a very good uh, drawing. Uh, this is taken from McDonald and uh, Denotta just a brief description of the Cotman triangle and the images done by Dr. Yingji. And um, here we see uh, this, uh, this bone. And there is a uh, malignant tumor in the metaphysial region. 
And usually uh, the periost is lying on the bone. And when there is a tumor that expands the bone or destroys the bone, the periost is lifted. And if you do this uh, at a very, very slow level, uh, the periost has the chance to mineralize. Um, but in the Cotman triangle, uh, this is an incomplete mineralization because the mineralization um, is stopped uh, where the, where the uh, uh, causing lesion lifts uh, the periosteum so fast that this, that this cannot be completely mineralized. So a Cotman triangle is always an incomplete triangle. And especially when you see this Cotman triangle, this is a red flag for a malignant tumor form. I'll show you one example. Um, so um, this is a young patient, um, about 19, 20 years old. And here we see an osteolytic lesion in the metaphyseal uh, region of the distal femur. And you can see uh, that the periosteum is lifted here. This is even better. You see a small lift, and here the periosteum is uh, um, lifted and the, um, the reactive bone is mineralized, but here the mineralization stops and here's the tumor. So this tiny incomplete triangle is a Cotman triangle. And this is a Ewing sarcoma of the distal femur. So the last point is intralesional matrix, which can give us a lot of information. And we do find it in benign, as well as in malignant bone tumors. Uh, in cartilaginous tumors, uh, we usually got calcification. And in bone forming tumors, we've got osteoid and true compact bone formation, as easy as that. So I show you some examples. So this is an osteochondroma, uh, this is an uh, anchondroma, sorry, uh, with calcifications. You can see that those calcifications are quite dense. They are even as dense as the cortical bone, like here. And it's characteristically that they are lobulated and a little bit of popcorn aspect. So this is quite characteristic for uh, dystrophic calcifications and enchondroma. Of course, this could also be chondrosarcoma. Um, the matrix doesn't tell us anything about the dignity of the lesion. The next example is a low-grade central osteosarcoma with neoplastic bone formation. Here, you can see that this uh, tumor, the skull base, expands the bone and causes some mineralization. The image is inhomogeneous, and it's not sharply demarcated, especially when you take a look at the borders of the tumor. This is very, um, very inhomogeneous and not sharply demarcated. Um, and this sclerotic um, impression is due to the tumor osteoid production. Um, and here is an OFD-like adamantinoma. And you can see that this tumor doesn't um, like any uh, matrix. So uh, the absence of matrix is also a diagnostic because the OFD-like adamantinoma doesn't create bone or cartilage or show some prominent uh, dystrophic calcifications. Um, you see the demarcation is relatively sharp, um, but the uh, adjacent bone becomes sclerotic. And this is also an important feature sometimes the lesion uh, induces uh, a reactive uh, bone and sclerosis in the periphery. So uh, those were basically those um, four, uh, six basic rules. And um, we've seen a lot of radiology right now, but we haven't seen uh, some histology. And you may ask why, because well, I'm a pathologist and you should expect that I show you some histology, I'll do that. Uh, but the basic question is, um, as a pathologist, um, I can see every single cell of the lesion. Uh, why should I be familiar with the radiology? Well, you win the information of a whole 
additional diagnostic discipline. And some lesions cannot be discriminated um, by histology alone. This is important to know. You can make a lot of diagnosis with your microscope and your tissue, uh, but you cannot solve all the cases with your microscope. So um, you should use this additional information because bone pathology is hard enough. So don't make it harder for yourself. So, and to uh, illustrate this, I will give you some examples. So uh, this is a case example of a 24 years old woman. She has got an osteolytic lesion in the left lower jaw. And the clinical information was suspicion of central giant cell granuloma, CGCG. So there it is. Um, here we got a quite classic example of a giant cell granuloma. Um, well, it's located in the jaws, here in the posterior region. It expands the bone and has got an inhomogeneous, predominantly osteolytic image, sharply demarcated at the periphery and uh, in a unilocal uh, formation. This is the histology. Um, we see uh, there's an older histology, so the color is not perfect, but we will improve uh, during the speech. So, but we see a um, spindle cell stroma. Those are spindle or ovoid cells with intermingled uh, multinucleated giant cells. No atypia, and this is also very characteristic for a, a CGCG. Here, a higher magnification, again, no atypia, and spindle cell stroma, cell rich and intermingled uh, multinucleated giant cells. So this is it. You can you might spot some delicate vessels and hemosiderin deposits, and the therapy is a curatage. So the next case is six years old boy, a tumor on the left lower jaw, clinical information, dignity. That was all. And here again, you see a stroma that is composed of spindle cells with intermingled multinucleated osteoclast-like giant cells. So the same histology than before. So this would fit to a giant cell granuloma. So and when I encountered this case, I almost uh, made this diagnosis. Uh, but then I thought maybe I should take a look at the radiology. So, and I did that. And this was uh, the digital volume tomogram. And you can see here a symmetrical extension of the jaw on both sides. That's interesting. And here you see that this is a huge deformity of the skeleton. And again, if you go to the front view, there seem to be lesions that expand the bone on both sides. Again, you can see this even more. So uh, this is symmetrical lesions. Uh, involving the jaws and also the maxilla bone. So what might that be? Uh, this is carabism. Uh, the histology of the carabism is identical to the giant cell granuloma. It's indistinguishable on histology alone. And therefore, every bone pathologist uh, has to know at least um, some basic uh, facts of the radiology, because otherwise uh, you will miss this um, lesion completely. So just a little, little excursion to the carabism. You see this, uh, this is a Sistine Madonna. It's an old painting by the Italian artist Raffel and one of his uh, last pictures. Um, so uh, you can see this um, in Germany at the Gemälde Galerie Alter Meister in Dresden. 
and it's uh, from 1513 to 1514 painted. And of course, this is a very beautiful painting. You see uh, 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 Maria with a Jesus child, for example. And then uh, the lower part, you see those guys here, those little angels. And they became even more famous because they look so nice, they look so cute. And um, they are called, uh, um, well, um, in strictly terms, uh, those are no cherubims. Um, those are merely seraphims because they've got uh, wings and they look like humans. And the angels of the higher hierarchy uh, are named cherubims and they do not interact with humans. So basically, those are seraphims. Uh, but, uh, but whatever um, the name of cherubism comes from uh, those Renaissance paint, uh, paintings, because um, the look of the faces uh, was like uh, uh, in, the, in the patients with this genetic order. So uh, cherubism is an autosomal dominant hereditary disease. There are some spontaneous cases. Um, it manifests in early age and um, about 75% uh, are associated with a specific mutation or they are associated with other um, genetic disorders like Newman syndrome, Raman syndrome, and Fragile X syndrome. Uh, the therapy is only functional and uh, under aesthetic considerations. So I took you some nice image from the literature where we can see the similarity between the Raphael painting and uh, a real life human quite well. This is from this publication. It's a very good clinical image. And again, uh, the chirurgism is um, indistinguishable from the giant cell, um, central giant cell granuloma. So um, now I hope uh, I uh, uh, told you some, uh, some basic skills on bone pathology and uh, evaluating um, radiographs, you see some histology, and I think now you are ready for the case report. Um, this was a 30-year-old woman who lives and works in northern Germany. Um, she noticed um, pain in the distal femur when she was doing some exercise, when she was running. And the pain lasted and she had light intermittent fever. Uh, she travels a lot. And this is her travel history of the last 12 months. Canary Islands, well, not so exotic, not that special. Um, New York, well, it's an intercontinental trip, uh, but New York is an urban circumstance. This is today also not very special. Uh, then we've got Goa in India, which is truly uh, exotic in terms of Northern Germany. And we've got one trip to Costa Rica. This is also a very uh, unusual location to travel to. So uh, the history uh, lasted on and six months later, the pain and the fever were still present. So she went to the doctor. There were no other findings in the history or at physical examination. So a um, diagnostic workup was done with focus on um, infections. So um, extensive microbiology was done there was no detection of a disease causing germ. And uh, histology was taken, which revealed osteomyelitis, but no pathogen. So given the fact that we had osteomyelitis on histology, more extensive microbiology, including local and national reference centers was done, but there's still no disease causing organism. So the diagnostic workup went on and a second biopsy from the joint space was taken to gain material with infectious organisms to provide a therapeutic regimen. So and repeated extensive microbiology was done because this was uh, what the biopsy was for. Again, including local and national reference centers, 
and there was still no disease causing organism detected. So uh, this also, uh, this all happened not at our institution, so I do not have any histological images or, um, um, or further material, it just is, this is just provided uh, from the clinical records. So um, just a brief excursion to osteomyelitis. So what we can expect in a chronic osteomyelitis, this is defined as a progressive inflammatory process with variable periods of quiescence. Um, the diagnostic gold standard would be a positive bone culture and positive bone histology. Common pathogens in adult osteomyelitis are Staphylococcus, <clears throat> MRSA, Staphylococcus epidermidis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Serratia marquescans, and E. coli. And mycobacteria and fungal infections are generally uncommon, and they are often associated with immunodeficiency. One exception might be the tuberculosis might be because we do not see this so infrequently. So um, I show you uh, some pictures of a usual um, uh, chronic osteomyelitis. You see here a woven bone, immature woven bone lined, lined by osteoblast. You see a, a fibrous stroma with a sparse chronic inflammatory infiltrate consisting of lymphocytes and plasma cells. And I'm going to show you some uh, lamellar bone, which is normal bone. They have the lamellar structure. And here you see uh, some plasma cells with um, some lymphocytes. And if you do polarization optics, which I do in every bone specimen, you can see the lamellar structure. So this is normal healthy bone. And here again, this is woven bone. This is a woven uh, image. This is reactive bone. So this is a pathologic uh, condition. Again, you see osteoblasts on the surface and you see multinucleated osteoclast, uh, osteoclasts doing some resorption. So in this bone, there's something going on, but um, the infiltrate is chronic and mixed inflammatory. You see again, a lot of lymphocytes scattered. You see um, fibrous tissue. You see again, a woven bone. Here's a high identification of the chronic infiltrate. And again, you see a lot of lymphocytes and some plasma cells in a fibrous stroma. There are some hemosiderin deficits. So now you know what osteomyelitis looks like under the microscope. Then the patient came to our clinic and um, we did a, a third biopsy because the clinical information was known osteomyelitis, uh, suspicion of rare mycosis or other rare infection. And therefore uh, this third biopsy was done. And here you can see the plain radiograph um, of uh, this distal femur that was painful. Um, there are some defects due to the previous um, biopsies. For example, here, um, well, the point is not that quick as I want it to be. So maybe I disconnect the camera because this can sometimes slow down. Yeah, let's see. Not even better, so I'm just using the arrow. I think you can deal with this. Um, here we see a defect due to a previous biopsy. This was the other biopsy, and this was our biopsy. So if we focus on the, uh, on the bone that's far away from biopsy, like here and here and here, you easily can spot that uh, this has got a sclerotic uh, impression. So compared to the tibia, uh, this is very sclerotic and inhomogeneous. You see some lytic areas here, also here and here and here, and here and here and here. And the bone is expanded a little bit. This becomes even, even more transparent here. You see sclerotic, more lytic, more lytic, sclerotic. So an inhomogeneous appearance, but no uh, well-formed and impressive tumor. 
So just an interoperative um, image. We see that we um, went deep into the bone. So there it's from. And here we see a CT uh, imaging here from the first biopsy, here from the second biopsy. And the CT images um, highlights the inhomogeneous structure. You see little lysis, sclerosis, lysis, sclerosis. So an inhomogeneous architecture. Um, at this point, of course, uh, an osteomyelitis uh, is likely. But we also know that uh, the major and most important differential diagnosis tells the diagnosis to osteomyelitis is a bone tumor. So um, if you've got osteomyelitis and you've got pain and uh, you have an inhomogeneous radiology, always exclude malignancy. So here we go. Um, some more imaging, inhomogeneous, lytic. So, and again here. So now we take a look at the histology and I will share you with you my screen. So you uh, will uh, uh, yeah, um, so you will be able, to follow this live microscopy, you should now be able to see my screen, I hope. So I turn on the light. So it's a little bit feasible sometimes. So I just connect and disconnect. Yes. Okay, there you see uh, my actual screen that should be visible quite well, I hope. So this um, is an overview of this lesion. It was a curatage uh, specimen. You see a lot of bone like this. So just the arrow like this. So oh, a little bit darker. So the arrow becomes more visible. Yeah. So you see a bone trabecular anywhere and some intratrabecular tissue. So we go to a higher magnification like this. And what is easily to, to, to notice uh, that this is like that, yeah. Uh, but this is no normal intratrabecular matrix. So usually we are fat or, um, or maybe some small vessels, but this needs to be further investigated. Is quite sensitive. Just alter it a little bit. Oh. Yeah, I think they are, yes. This might be. Okay, there you see um, some proliferations of cells which do not belong there. And they are hyperchromatic. And atypical. Uh, this is a spindle cell, which uh, should not be in the bone. Of course, there are some information, uh, but it's dense, and they uh, are polymorphic and spindle cell. And here you can see some mitosis. But right here, this is a mitosis. And they are quite adjacent to the bone. And you can see here uh, that there's initial production of some matrix. And if you go up here, you again see some bone matrix. So here are the spinner cells, atypical. Those are 
uh, cells that belong to the same group, but we lay down some matrix. So this is osteoid. And this is a malignant tumor. So I will go back to the presentation. So here again, you see uh, again those atypical polymorphic spindle cells, mitotically active. Here again, dense infiltrates of atypical cells. Here you see hyperchromatic cells, very different shapes. Again, here, spindle cells. Here is mitotic figure. Again, mitotic figures and highly atypical cells. Again, mitotic figures, hyperchromatic cells. Here, mitotic figures and a remarkable polymorphism. And here, what you've seen before, this is matrix. So this is also. Uh, so uh, this diagnosis is not compatible with uh, a chronic osteomyelitis. This is a malignant tumor. And this is a malignant mesenchymal tumor that's producing osteoid. So this is osteosarcoma. Um, of course, this was not expected. So I sent this case for consultation because we've got two diagnoses, osteomyelitis before. And then if you say uh, um, osteosarcoma, it's better to, to have a second opinion because of course you will have to discuss uh, this diagnosis. So, um, but in the meantime, uh, we got more histology um, because we uh, embed uh, it at in a disc decalcified way. And we also do some embedding, uh, embedding in, let's say plastic, so methyl methacrylate. So we can even investigate cortical bone in a reasonable uh, time window. And when we investigate the cortical bone, those objects became visible. Again here, round, round, round objects that do not uh, match with anything uh, we know in bone can appear. So those little tiny circles with some material. We, uh, I did some further stains like the PAS stain and those granules lighted up. I also did some grow cut stain and those structures uh, became black. So what is this? So this looks like a spheral. So a tiny capsule with some organisms in the central part of it. So um, given the fact that uh, the initial diagnosis was osteomyelitis, uh, I need to do some investigations to see what it's all about. And uh, well, I, uh, it was very difficult to find out because um, these objects um, are quite rare in Northern Germany. So this is a spheral, this is a spheral, this is a spheral, and this is a spheral. And if you are familiar with those organisms, it's quite an easy diagnosis. So this is uh, cochidiodomycosis. And uh, this image is taken from uh, this publication in the Journal of Medicine, which illustrates the uh, similarity between those objects. And I found also a very good uh, information resource. This is the uh, currentcountyvalleyfever.com homepage. Uh, because this um, is a fungus that lives in the soil in areas of North America, Middle America, and South America. And uh, it produces some aerosols. And if the patient inhales those aerosols, um, the organism multiplies in the form of uh, these little spherules, predominantly in, in the lungs of uh, immunocompromised patients. And that's what those large spherules look like when they blow up and then they reproduce again in the human body. 
Um, also uh, from the song page, a very good um, resource. And um, this disease is also called the valley fever because it's quite uh, uh, frequent in some endemic regions in, uh, in America. And um, of course, uh, we're not used to this diagnosis. So in Northern Germany, you won't find this. And it's very difficult to guess if you do not know that a certain individual um, has traveled to this endemic regions. So, and if, but if you compare it, the diagnosis is quite easy. So this is the Broca stain of a spherule with the organisms in it. And um, here you see the image um, from this um, belly fever homepage. So um, and now the uh, diagnosis of the uh, Koch C. deodo mycosis is quite uh, easy. So the final diagnosis was hybrid osteosarcoma with coincident fungal infection with Cochidiodo mycosis imitis. Um, the patient uh, was uh, treated, uh, unfortunately not in our hospital, but uh, uh, I was again very happy that the diagnosis was established. So the tumor was dissected and followed by um, chemotherapy. So this is the um, prosthesis and a uh, control uh, radiograph one year after therapy. And um, uh, fortunately, I received uh, the pathology report of the um, resection specimen, and uh, which confirmed the spinal cell and pleomorphic sarcoma of bone, but didn't detect any formation of neoplastic bone. Um, and also uh, the coccidiodo mycosis was not mentioned. So, um, um, but there are ways to explain this. Um, first of all, um, uh, the, uh, the osteoid formation can be quite sparse. So you can embed five, 10, six um, tissue blocks. You have a high grade pleomorphic and spinal cell sarcoma and you do not see the osteoid. So therefore it might be that it was just focal and I was very lucky that I've seen it on the small biopsy specimen. However, in this case, it's not of clinical relevance because the therapy regimen for osteosarcoma and spinal cell pleomorphic sarcoma of bone is completely similar. Uh, the other thing is that um, the organism can also be inhomogeneously distributed. And we have seen that the cord of the bone was a factor in our cases. In the biopsy specimen of the curatage material, I did not spot any uh, infectious uh, germ. So it might be just um, not sampled because the, the, um, the resection specimen is basically uh, sampled for, uh, for malignancy and resection margins. So therefore this might happen. Anyway, um, uh, we stick to the diagnosis of a, um, um, of a hybrid osteosarcoma with coincident fungal infection with cochidiodo mycosis imitus. And um, the teaching point of this case uh, shall be uh, that you always um, ex should expect the unexpected. The th second issue that you should um, take the radiology into consideration and that you always uh, keep in mind the differential diagnosis uh, of malignant bone tumor when you are dealing with an osteomyelitis. Yeah, well, uh, so I um, come to the end of my presentation. I thank you for your um, intention and I'm attention and I'm very happy to ask uh, your, to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention. You are very welcome. Thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. And it was very informative presentation and it has made our concepts more clear. Thank you very much for your time and this presentation. Any questions, please? Anyone would like to ask any question? As the presentation was very clear and very vivid for everyone. Okay, I think there is no questions as everybody's concepts are clear now, but